The history of humanity is a long procession of technological development. Much of what we know about our ancestors and the types of lives they lived comes from our limited knowledge of the tools they used. Over the centuries and millennia, these tools have become more sophisticated. From the dawn of agriculture to today's cutting edge advancements in bioengineering, an untold number of mostly unknown individuals have made countless improvements and innovations. These people and the tools they created over time have fundamentally altered our way of interacting with the world and each other. The pace of these technological changes picked up considerably with the rise of capitalism. The development of new tools, weapons, and production techniques had always been shaped by the practical needs, culture, and political structure of a given society. But wherever capitalism spread, it worked to chip away at these local and regional differences, replacing them with the universal value of progress, a watchword for the pursuit of economic growth through the organization of human activity under a framework of universal competition. The industrial age has been marked by three successive revolutions, each characterized by inventions that changed the entire technological playing field. First came the harnessing of steam, a feat that allowed for the development of early factories and the construction of vast railway networks. Second came the mastering of petroleum, which fueled the development of modern cities, mass industrial manufacturing, and the horrors of two world wars. Third came the networked personal computer, a device that has thoroughly transformed nearly every aspect of modern life. Today, humanity stands poised on the threshold of the fourth industrial revolution, a wide-reaching social transformation expected to be characterized by advances in the fields of robotics, quantum computing, artificial intelligence, and 3D printing. Over the next 30 minutes, we'll speak with a number of individuals as they break down some of these latest trends and discuss how these systems are being fused together to design new regimes of totalitarian surveillance and control. Along the way, we'll discuss some of the countermeasures that people are taking to thwart these systems by constructing open source alternatives, sabotaging infrastructure, and making a whole lot of trouble. Technology is the reproduction of a human society as seen through a technical lens. It's the specific how of social reproduction. Any analysis of technology is by nature contextual, especially when one intends to portray it either as an essential fundamental question, or whether that's an attempt to say that technology is, is essentially or always good, good in its own right, or whether to say that it's essentially bad or bad in its own right. Technological developments do not happen in a vacuum. They are heavily influenced by and benefit those who exert power over others. I would argue that most technological advances made in our context work towards expanding the state's ability to manage economic growth and social control. Technology is based within political economic systems and systems of power that come to shape how those technologies can be used. I think that more and more we're seeing, in terms of the geographic context that we're located in here, in North America, that technologies are being used to propel and buttress the capitalist economic system. An anarchist approach to technology has to take into account the authoritarian nature of technology, the fact that we don't really have a choice in the matter, that all of these new developments, all of these new innovations, all of these new products are, are coming down on us whether we like it or not. Technology, first and foremost, isn't used to make our lives more fun. It's used to increase economic exploitation and to increase the military power of the state. Secondarily, if, if it can produce gadgets that can entertain us, uh, like bread and circus, those will also be produced. Technological changes of the last 10 to 15 years have drastically eroded the division between labor time and free time. Currently, we're always on call. 
we're always expected to be responsive to the needs of the market, to the needs of our employers. It's also led to an extreme increase in social alienation and emotional alienation masked by extreme connectivity. So quantifiably, people have more connections than ever, more friends than ever, but in terms of the quality of those relationships, very few people have a large, strong network they can actually confide in or that can actually support them. Do you or do you not collect identifiers like name, age, and address? Yes or no? You're creating an account, yes, and using an account, yes. yes. Specific search histories when person types something into a search bar. If you have search history turned on, yes. Device identifiers like IP address or IMEI. Uh, depending on the situation, we could be collecting it, yes. GPS signals, Wi-Fi signals, Bluetooth beacons. It would, would depend on the specifics, so, but there may be situations, yes. The GPS, yes. Uh, yes. Contents of emails and Google documents. We store the data, but we don't read or look at G your Gmail. Do you have you? access to them? Uh, as, a, as a company, we have access to them, yes. So you could. Startups or huge corporations like Google are sucking up your data and storing it forever and they're grabbing way too much data about us. Like everything you click on, everything you like, everything your friends like, all of the people you know, where you're going, everything about you. And they're storing it forever and sometimes even working together to build up a bigger profile on you that they can then sell for profit. Now that data itself has become a thing of value, and in many ways the foundation of the new economy, by participating in all of these different virtual networks, Facebook, Google, using our cell phones, uh, all of these things, we're producing value. So that, that really gets rid of this notion of, of being off the clock, of being able to punch the clock and, and leave the workplace behind. Over the past decade, we've seen the rise and the commodification of different data such as one's preferences, habits, and social circles. We need to see how capitalism was in fact growing and sustaining itself through the surveillance of human beings and their lived environments, and then turning that surveillance into data that could then be traded basically as a commodity in the marketplace. This information allows companies like Google and Amazon to not only aggressively market new products and create new needs, but also to sell this information or collaborate with governments in efforts of social control. This is a new form of extractive industry, where the renewable resources are the precise things that make up people's identities. Capitalism, like cancer, is based on perpetual growth. This insatiable urge is hardwired into capital's DNA, compelling it to constantly search for new resources to exploit and markets to invest in, transforming everything it touches into a commodity. Its first conquest was the land itself. The commons were closed off, the so-called new world was invaded and plundered, and the vast expanses of the earth were carved into individual parcels of private property be bought and sold as commodities. Robbed of our land, the next conquest was our time. Our ability to reproduce ourselves as individuals and communities, like generations of our ancestors had done before, was soon broken up into discrete tasks and commodified as wage labor. This process cut deep. Factories were designed and constantly reorganized, with a ruthless eye towards efficiency and productivity. New ways of commodifying human activity were devised eventually expanding to encompass nearly all of our social relationships and means of entertainment. Now that it's finally approaching the limits of its expansion, capital is desperately searching for new elements of reality to commodify. It's looking to the very building blocks of life, to genetic engineering and nanotechnologies. And it's looking at the very essence of our humanity itself by recording everything that we do and transforming it into commodities for those seeking to understand how we make decisions in order to predict future behavior. Artificial intelligence works by combining large amounts of data, 
with algorithms that can learn from patterns or features present. It is a broad term that has many different branches. When we talk about AI today, most of the time, we refer to its applications around machine learning. Machine learning allows systems to learn and improve, based on input and experience, rather than programming. The machine identifies patterns and can make decisions based on that with minimal or no human intervention. When the Pentagon contracted Google to provide assistance in drone targeting, they were using machine learning. Online workers would identify objects or people on series of images taken from drones, and when enough of them did that enough times, the machine, through patterns, could differentiate different things and learn to identify things on its own. Deep Learning A more recent application of machine learning, also trains computers to perform tasks like making predictions or identifying images, but instead of organizing the data to run through predefined equations, deep learning trains the computer to learn by using much more layers of processing. It moves away from telling a computer how to solve a problem, and towards letting it figure out how to do it alone, closer to how humans learn to solve problems. Self-driving cars are the most well-known example of deep learning in action, but things like targeted advertising, robotics, and cybersecurity could all benefit from deep learning development. There's been a lot of imagination around artificial intelligence, so some people who, who fetishize it more, they imagine people being able to like, upgrade their consciousness or plug their mind into some cloud computing system. I think that's a silly fantasy. Capitalism currently has no interest whatsoever in helping people use these forms of artificial intelligence to become more intelligent themselves when it makes a lot more sense to let the machines do all the thinking for us and then to deliver us some final finished product as passive consumers and that way also you, you maintain these computing capabilities with the companies that own the proprietary software. Artificial intelligence increases greatly the effectiveness of surveillance, the possibilities for social control. The predictive algorithms that make artificial intelligence work, they create a police state, uh, but a police state in which you don't have to have a cop on every corner because everyone carries the cop in their pocket. Right over there behind me is the future site of Sidewalk Toronto. It's the proposal's modular housing and office buildings will study occupants' behavior while they're inside them to make life easier. According to the proposal, residents and workers will be universally connected by powerful broadband and served by futuristic conveniences. A smart city can't be understood or discussed without reaching back and talking about surveillance capitalism. A smart city isn't just a city that has technology in it. It's a city with a certain kind of ideological framework that uses technology to reach its end goals. A smart city is usually understood as a urban environment that uses ubiquitous sensing technology and data analytics to understand phenomenon within city spaces. On the data end of things, smart cities claim to be collecting more data, which they are, and claim to be using that collection and, and analysis to better respond to urban issues from environmental degradation to transportation planning and the like. We can analyze four different features of the smart city. The first is to increase and integrate surveillance of many, many different kinds. Second, to create a superficial sense of participation among the inhabitants of a city, to encourage economic growth at two different levels, localized gentrification and impelling this new economy that is taking shape. The final function of a smart city is to create a superficial arena in which people can passively support ecological or environmental proposals while also denying them the opportunity to develop a global consciousness of the environment and of environmental problems. So smart cities are different and not so different from cities that exist in capitalism. But I think that the difference would be the use of technology to further surveil the public and to use that data to intervene in ways that can increasingly control and manage the population that suits the interests of a political economy of capitalism. A second feature that differentiates smart cities from traditional cities or cities of the past is the marriage of planning to corporate leadership. State apparatuses of control through policing have an incentive to use these technologies because they do a really good job of surveilling the public. 
Crime analytics have a long history, sort of like this broken window stuff and the targeting of neighborhoods. That, that's been happening for a long time. Now you see the excuse being offered that this is data driven. So we're gonna be in these neighborhoods because we have the data to prove that these neighborhoods need more policing. The data collected through smart cities can have a really negative effect that way by giving people with power who want to wield it more of a reason within the current framework of evidence-based policing that they can then go in these neighborhoods and remain there and, and that's okay. We're living on the edge of a terrifying new era. Barring any serious disruptions to current research and development timelines, the coming years and decades will see the rise of machines able to make decisions and carry out a series of complex tasks without the need for human operators. This will almost certainly include a new generation of autonomous weapons and policing systems connected to sophisticated networks of surveillance and equipped with self-correcting target selection algorithms. Whole sectors of the economy will be automated, leading to a massive labor surplus. Much of the technology needed to accomplish this already exists, but is being held back as states try to figure out how to pull it off without triggering widespread revolt. A mass consumer rollout of augmented and virtual reality technologies will blur the lines between the material and digital worlds. Handing control of our senses over to tech capitalists and state security agencies, all in the name of convenience and entertainment. You might feel a slight twinge as it initializes. Well done. Holy fuck! Holy shit! He, fuck, he's right! He's right! He's right! I can I... Where you go? <laughs> this is the future they have in store for us. Don't say you weren't warned. Smart cities now as they exist and also going into the future even more so, they're going to be collecting a lot of data and that data is going to be responded to not even by human beings, it's going to be responded to by algorithmic governance essentially. Say you have an issue in a city and generally speaking if we think of democratic theory we can discuss that issue and then we have a decision making process right and it's terrible and it's always been imbued with power relationships but what a smart city does is it transfers that process into the hands of a private corporation it's analyzed in terms of data and it's immediately responded to just through that process of data analysis so i think smart cities are one of the sort of genesis sites of this kind of new regime of governance it's interesting that this function arose largely from social movements themselves. So the 15M movement, the Real Democracy Now! movement in Barcelona, was built in large part by one sector that envisioned rejuvenating democracy through new technological implements that could allow more instantaneous communication, that could allow more instantaneous polling of citizens, and that could also find a way to allow power holders to select citizen initiatives and deploy them more rapidly. So these activists were approaching the crisis of democracy with a sort of acritical technological lens, that democracy can be made better not by answering real questions of who holds power and how power is reproduced, but simply by proposing that if you bring better tools to the table, then all these problems will go away. And that discourse and the practices behind it were very attractive to progressive municipal governments. Urban geographers have long talked about a splintering urbanism, and basically that's just the ways in which cities divide along economic and class lines, and cultural and racial lines as well. I can see that sort of happening with the smart city that's going to replicate those patterns, and certain neighborhoods are gonna have more access to these technologies in a way that might actually help them, and certain neighborhoods are gonna have more surveillance on them by these technologies. So you're going to kind of see multiple cities emerging and being reinforced through the technology that's being placed within them and on them. So basically, in neighborhoods where people embrace this smart city model, you'll see more integration and in other neighborhoods people will be coming more into contact with the stick. Because we are fighting authority and the state, our struggles will always be criminalized. As technologies have evolved, new types of forensic evidence emerge. 
when the police were no longer able to respond to the thousands of calls that they were getting during the 2011 riots in London, the city began crowdsourcing the identities of suspected rioters through a fucking smartphone app. The cops asked citizen snitches to download the app and help them identify people that had been caught on CCTV. The snitches could then confidentially give names and or addresses of suspects. Charges were filed against more than a thousand people using this technique. Mass data collection has happened for a while, but there was a lack of ability to analyze all of it efficiently. That's no longer the case. Right now, the police or security agencies need to physically look up people's location data to figure out who was where, and at what time. But soon enough it'll be easy for an algorithm to look through all of the data available in a given area and cross-reference this with people's online preferences, relationships, etc. With uh, this, this anti-social response to the increase in social control, I think you're also going to see an increase in mental health regimes. Because when you have total surveillance, crime becomes impossible, or at least it becomes impossible to do things that are against the law and get away with them. So they will start to classify any behaviors that for them don't fit in, into this new happy smart city model as antisocial behavioral disorders. So these are no longer crimes, these are antisocial behavioral disorders, and the culprits, they need to be re-educated and they need to be chemically neutralized. Oh, good afternoon. My name is Sophia, and I am the latest and greatest robot from Hanson Robotics. I want to use my artificial intelligence to help humans live a better life. Like design smarter homes, build better cities of the future, etc. I will do my best to make the world a better place. Everyone who works in artificial intelligence is warning that artificial intelligence and automation have the potential of causing 80% unemployment. Of the 15 top job categories in the United States, 12 of those are seriously threatened by artificial intelligence. But in the past, there have also been major technological shifts that got rid of the vast majority of job categories at the time. And there was temporary unemployment, but very quickly new job categories appeared. There's no certainty whatsoever that this will catch up to the, the automation, the artificial intelligence that has already been occurring, which is why a lot of people in the high tech sector are already talking about a universal income or a guaranteed basic income. This would basically be socialism, not when the productive forces have developed to the point that everyone could get fed, the productive forces have been there for decades, if not centuries. Contrary to the Marxist argument, we can have this evolution towards socialism at the point where the technologies of social control evolve enough that the state no longer needs to use hunger as a weapon. In other words, everyone can be given bread when they can be trusted to work or to obey without the threat of hunger. These days, the term Luddite is shorthand for someone who stubbornly refuses to learn and adapt to new technologies. Originally, the word referred to a movement of textile workers in early 19th century England who were known for sabotaging the industrial machines that were beginning to replace them. Pledging allegiance to the fictional King Ludd, who was said to occupy the same Shearwood Forest as Robin Hood, these Luddites attacked mills and factories, destroyed steam-powered looms, and even assassinated the wealthy capitalists of their day. The motive behind the Luddites' attacks was not, as is commonly understood, a general hatred of technology. It was an awareness that certain technology was being implemented in a way that made their lives worse off. Ultimately, their uprising failed, and there's nothing particularly revolutionary in the first place about sabotaging machines just to keep your job. But one takeaway from the Luddites' rebellion is that people don't always accept new technologies or the new social roles that accompany them with open arms. And that realization can be the starting point for all types of resistance. I think that anarchists should not avoid technology, quite the opposite, I think it should be used subversively when possible. We can look back at the Bono gang of illegalists, 
using cars to rob the rich in France in the early 1900s as an example, or hackers like Jeremy Hammond, who is serving 10 years for exposing Stratford security and expropriating hundreds of thousands of dollars from our enemies. Cyber thieves made off with the personal details of hundreds of thousands of subscribers, and it's emerged some of those subscribers hold key positions in the British government, military and police. There are certainly a lot of anarchists like myself in open source software development. We are talking together and we are all trying to make things better. The types of projects that we work on are quite diverse. I know many anarchist programmers and hackers who build websites. I know others like myself who do cryptography. Although I think that we should use technology to our advantage when it exists, I also believe that new technologies tend to disproportionately give an advantage to the state, corporations, the police, judges, prisons, and borders. Technologies should be used, but their development should be fought, because we rarely come out on top when it comes to the application of these inventions. I think it's important to look at the kinds of projects that are developing in your city, and map out the research and development initiatives. A lot of this industry is operating very openly in startups and yuppie labs that face very little resistance. This allows them to get major funding, because they seem like safe investments that have the potential to get investors some serious cash. Messing with that sense of security can hurt the industry, and it can also allow others to see that resistance is still possible. As for these new technologies, at this point a lot of these systems still have bugs, or can't deal with people intentionally using them wrong. In London when the crowdsourced snitching app was released, people intentionally submitted tons of fake reports to throw off the cops. If more people start messing with their little gadgets, they'll be less effective and less likely to be applied in more places. For these projects to function, a lot of infrastructure is needed. These softwares cannot be developed in thin air, they need hardware, that means computers and backup drives. The information also moves around mostly through networks of fiber optic cables. Those have been sabotaged all around the world very effectively. The data also has to be stored, which happens in data centers. Those can be pretty small, but can also be gigantic buildings that need their own cooling systems and 24-7 security. Finally, a lot of these projects need people to work together, often in labs sponsored by companies, universities or both. A lot of these labs and co-working spaces for startups are easy to find. One of them was attacked with Molotovs in Berlin, by people fighting against the proliferation of Google startups. There has been a lot of resistance to the Sidewalk Ops project in Toronto. A lot of work that, you know, points out the myriad issues with the Sidewalk Ops project and um, mounts a public education campaign against that. So there's been a lot of concerned citizens and activists that have come out to all the meetings that Sidewalk Labs has been um, hosting, public forums, consultation sessions, and a lot of folks are really worried. Privacy experts dropping out of the project and saying, I can't sign my name to this. People have always been able to get away with attacking power, with sabotaging power, anonymously, without getting caught it's still possible to attack. And that will remain so for, for maybe forever, but at the very least for the immediate foreseeable future. So while it is certainly still possible to, to break the law, to, to attack the system, uh, people need to be very careful about being conscious of what they're doing, being aware that you know, they're carrying a snitch in their pocket or that they're, they're willingly entrusting these corporations with 95% of their social life. It's really difficult to resist something that we don't really know a lot about and players involved haven't really shared with the public everything that we probably need to know to mount a resistance campaign because we're just kind of talking about like, speculation. If people learn the actual technical capabilities of the state, they can learn the weaknesses and they can learn how to get away with sabotaging the economy, with going up against the state.
Given the active role that technological development continues to play in terms of deepening alienation, refining surveillance, engineering more destructive weapons, and hastening climate change, it's natural to feel a bit pessimistic about where things are headed. Our current trajectory is certainly aimed towards more sophisticated systems of mass behavior modification and social control. I've told you everything already! Take him instead of me, he's the top criminal. But it's also important to remember that despite all the money being spent trying to anticipate human decision making, nobody, not even Google, can predict the future. Throughout history, new technologies have repeatedly created unintended consequences for those in power. From Gutenberg's printing press spawning a revolt against the Catholic Church, to the early internet paving the way for hackers and the development of powerful peer-to-peer -peer encryption tools. As long as people have a will to resist, they will find the tools to do so. So at this point, we'd like to remind you that Treble is intended to be watched in groups and to be used as a resource to promote discussion and collective organizing. Are you interested in fighting back against the opening of new tech startups in your neighborhood, or just looking to incorporate a better understanding of next-gen technologies into your existing organizing? Consider getting together with some comrades, organizing a screening of this film, and discussing where to get started. Interested in running regular screenings of Trouble at your campus, info shop, community center, or even just at home with friends? Become a Troublemaker! For 10 bucks a month, we'll hook you up with an advanced copy of the show and a screening kit featuring additional resources and some questions you can use to get a discussion going. If you can't afford to support us financially, no worries. You can stream and or download all our content for free off our website, sub.media slash trouble. If you've got any suggestions for show topics or just want to get in touch, drop us a line at trouble at sub.media. We're now into the second month of our annual fundraising campaign. A huge thanks to everyone who has donated so far. If you haven't given yet and are in a position to do so, please consider becoming a monthly sustainer or making a one-time donation at sub.media slash donate. This episode would not have been possible without the generous support of Carla and Carla. Stay tuned next month for Trouble 20 as we take a closer look at the horrors of the prison industrial complex and talk to comrades fighting for its abolition. Prison fixes no problems. It doesn't make anything better. Prison is like the permanent threat that holds up all relationships of exchange and domination. It's the deeply felt sense that no matter how bullshit our lives are, there's still something the state can take away from us. Now get out there and make some trouble. Oh,